Uh, today's topic, chapter three, statistical properties of spatially autocorrelated data. I don't think we are going to get as far as statistical properties of spatially autocorrelated data, but uh, this is going to be an introduction to, uh, to the characteristics of, uh, uh, of spatial data and uh, briefly what autocorrelation is, and um, we are going to look at several uh, examples of data consisting uh, of trend, uh, deterministic trend, um, autocorrelated um, component, and, um, and uh, random uh, component. Okay, so, uh, Let's uh, have a look first at why spatial data are slightly different than uh, other sort of data we may get from experiments. This is a little formal introduction, but basically there are two components to spatial data. There is a set which for some reasons is called T. I think I can guess why, but OK, let's call it large T. This is an index set and we can imagine it as uh, our set of explanatory variables. And on the other side, we've got something that's called state space. These are the dependent variables. Um, and let's think now that it's just one uh, measurement, for example, temperature or for example, height, we can see it as a height on a, uh, on some region. T, small t, is a point in the set T, which is referenced by some index. So this is T1, T2, and so on, up to Tn. We are assuming that these um, sets are countable and they are sort of uh, discrete. So these are positions in uh, the, the T1 and T2 up to Tn are positions on some imaginary field. And this field can have one dimension or two dimensions or more dimensions. But anyway, this is not one position. T1 is a place somewhere. For example, it can be a point on a time axis, on a new, uh, number axis, or it can be a position, a location in the field, or it can be point in space having as many uh, variables, as, as many dimensions as we need. And against that, we've got the variable that is measured in many points and if these values here the variables in every point are random variables then the entire system that whole object is called stochastic process or random process i think that that this is my guess that the name of process here um is uh, inherited is sort of uh, uh, legacy from uh, the time when uh, from that situation when t is really a point in time we can uh, think about it uh, an example of that can be prices price of some stock um, on stock exchange well t is a day and y one, Y2, up to Yn are the prices of that stock on subsequent days. So I think this is what gave that index set name T. Uh, and that process is a process, but it can also be a stochastic uh, function. So what is most important from that? This is the set of variables that can be deemed explanatory, and we can see them as a positions in space. Every T1 has many, can be one unidimensional or can be multidimensional, and these are values in these points. 
So that's a sort of a function from this set uh, from this set to this one. Okay. Uh, good. Let's have a look at examples at typical examples. I might just say something about the jargon yeah. on the previous page, maybe. Is that um, I, I I don't know where the the language comes, but mm -hmm. spatial spatial processes that it's it's what they're called. They have their own jargon for how we call these variable sets, and you've summarized it, you know, very well here with just a few words. Um, but they, they link. I associate this language of process with um, with uh, the stochastic process bit. <clears throat> is uh, maybe adopted in looking at stocks and how things change through time but i associate it with a particular model that's explicitly spatial uh, called point process models and uh one application of it where this this jargon is used that's relevant for us is um in uh, for example um land cover um studies where we go down and ground truth um, some crop cover, let's say. What, what if we wanted to estimate crop cover at any point in time in any place in the world? And we had satellite pictures all over the world at, at some point in time and through time. And then we had some, some actual identify of, identification of some crops at some points on the Earth. And we want to extrapolate um, what is in places we haven't measured with the places we have measured. But we do that with a point process, and it's the, it's a joint statistic between one point in time where we can we can um, associate all the things we have measured um, with all the things we haven't measured at another point in time. And so the sto stochastic part of the stochastic process is um, pairing characteristics that are shared by, say, remote sensing. Uh, in time. Now that's that's where I that's how I think of this jargon. But it is specific to spatial statistics. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's only spatial problems that use this particular set of jargon. An another application that I've used and published some papers on is um, aside from the agriculture applications, um, where you want to infer the kind of habitat for species that's at a place in natural places, non built up places. But let's say that you're trying to rewild or reintroduce the black rhinoceros to uh, its former range in Kenya. And you might want to say, right, we find black rhinoceros in all these places and we measure uh, remote sensing characteristics of the, the points where we do find black rhino and we measure some other places where there's not black rhino and we measure all the things that are uh, comprised the habitat there. And mm -hmm. what we might want to do is find the places that are like the places where there is black rhino, but other places we haven't measured. That's also stochastic point process model. I just wanted to add that to this because um, it is just jargon. You've explained it perfectly well, but it's just jargon, and it's only spatial statistics that have this particular jargon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed. Uh, that basically, well, that reminds me of uh, something. You know, I wanted to uh, avoid it, to avoid in order to avoid confusion. But uh, as I understand that, just as T1 and T2 and so on are referenced, well, here they are referenced by index, yes, but they are itself can be, can be multidimensional. And typically in geospatial statistics, we will be using two coordinates to reference a T1. Also, the state function can be multidimensional. So Y1 can also be a point in space which has several variables and this sort of but i wanted to <laughs> avoid that because uh, here we've got another uh, another take i only wanted to see it as a function connecting t1 to y1 and t2 to y2 without very much thinking of what it is 
Okay, so let's go to this example. These are typical examples we can meet with. This is a geospatial example. And on this horizontal plane is our T set, the large T, capital T, uh, and every little T is a point here referenced by a pair of coordinates x y or longitude latitude or easting and noting typically um, a sort of x y coordinates well here is something that we measure it can be very namely height um, above sea level or it can be temperature in a point or any sort of um, thing we can measure here is a very simple example where this is a the axis of t, the time, which is, and some value, some variable has been sampled in points one, two, three, four, and so on. And we've got such a representation. And uh, I would like to concentrate for a moment on this simple example, because uh, this is a, in, in the jargon of spatial statistics, even if it's just time series, it's it's still like spatial. Um, and why is it spatial? I'm going to to, um, uh, to talk about in a moment. This uh, bunch of variable of bunch, uh, these values here are termed variables, and every of these we can see it as a this is a variable in point in time point one, this is a variable in point time two, this is a variable of point time three, and so on. And the the entire thing is a random set of variables, which is called a realization of the random field. If we blink one eye, it could be uh, randomly assigned the ever every point in time could be randomly assigned a new uh, value. Um, and this could happen also here. It's a, it's a potentiality in this process, in this entire process. This is one of realization of that process. And the question is here that um, even if there could be many realization of a given process, the researcher usually has got only one uh, realization of the random field to to, uh, to take the measurements from. Um, typically in geospatial statistics, when we measure the, uh, 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 the existence of black rhinoceros somewhere, We'll just go there and register it. This rhino, rhinoceros could be wandering around here and there with perhaps different um, um, different probabilities of occurring in different parts of Africa, but we usually have only one shot of that, and this is just one shot of a process. We can see random twenty random variables in it, which are sampled. And we have just one sample. Uh, a little more on the jargon. Why? And basically, this is the <laughs> answer to the question: Why is this spatial data? Because of the existence of that in the index set. In this in this set, we can define distance. Um, when you look at, let's jump to the first slide again. You look at that and you're asking, why is it spatial? Uh, there's many multi, um, uh, there's many uh, regression models with many variables, with many explanatory variables that jointly explain a, a dependent variable. Uh, I don't know, the temperature and uh, humidity can be explaining the probability of the uh, of apples to get uh, scabies, for example. 
So we've got several variables that can that translate into one variable. Uh, but for spatial data, in the T set, the relation of distance is um, defined. Um, and usually there exists some sort of, there can exist some sort of causality between the values on the left side and on the right side here. And this is when we get into uh, things like autocorrelation and uh, trends. OK, is it uh, so? Uh, the differences, the distances can be uh, defined in the uh, independent variables in the spatial component. And increment is a difference between two values that can exist in two locations. Um, OK, so the next thing, uh, the definition of stationarity of a process. Uh, this is an important thing. And uh, this is one of the definitions of stationarity. The process is stationary. If a sample taken from one region, I'm jumping back, back to the previous slide. If a sample taken from here has the same properties as sample taken from here or from here. In other words, a statistic of a sample, in fact, that, that should be well, statistic or statistics of a sample does not depend on what region of T of what spatial region the sample was drawn from. Yeah, I do agree with that, <laughs> with this definition. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think so. We could talk about it for a second if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I think that the difficult part of what you're explaining is because um, the way that you describe the world in mathematics must be uh, general to apply to any any possibility, and yet it has to be very accurate. But um, may, maybe I might try to put in my own words um, in very practical terms uh, to set to simplify it. And um, if you have uh, your your sets of predictors and your sets of dependent variables um, <clears throat> in the very general sense. Um, you know, they're random in the sense they can take on any value. Uh, but uh, in the real world, um, you know, if you go back to the same X and Y, the thing that's changing is the dependent variable, say for crop cover, yeah. Uh, and the, it's the, this, you, you said pretty nicely, uh, it's a lot of detail in the chapter and a lot of specificity, but um, you could sum up with a lot of the things that you've said in the in these couple of slides here by uh, hearkening back to that that tenet of uh, spatial statistics that um, stuff that's close together tends to be similar stuff that's far apart tends to be different and mm -hmm. um, the whole trick is is to find the similarities independent of distance while considering distance so uh, I, I i guess um i guess i'm happy with that Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that that's uh, my example with the uh, scab covered apples. When we build the statistical model uh, to, which is guessing if an if an apple is likely to be uh, to be scab scab scabbed 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 <laughs> covered in scab, uh, we are not taking. Uh, anything like 
similarity from one apple or from one ex set of explanatory variables to the uh, to the other one. Uh, we are not taking into account any distance. Uh, every uh, situation, every observation which is explained by a set of explanatory variables is separate. Um, while uh, here the spatial component, uh, we can define distance, we can uh, define the relationship of neighborhood and that sort of uh, stuff. Um, and uh, the what uh, at what you've just said about uh, the tendency of data from one region being uh, being more similar to the other, uh, which is very clearly seen here, um, is that um, uh, is already taking into account the um, the situation of autocorrelation or trend uh, or clumping similar um, data together, while uh, this um, uh, this picture has been created using a process that gives every dot an equal uh, chance of uh, being at a given height or being at a given uh, value. OK, so. Uh, the reasons why stationarity may not hold. Uh, we are going to go through um, a, uh, through a sample of code that will be presenting. Trend. And some autocorrelation, um, uh, some autocorrelation uh, component. Uh, but data can also uh, contain um, explicit periodicity, uh, for example, with some sort of, again, stock data uh, can show a different um, behavior of, uh, of um, buyers and uh, sellers in different days of a week uh, or something like that. So basically trend, which is treated as deterministic and this is the the job of linear of uh, uh, various sorts of regressions to uh, get the to uh, to find out what trend is behind the data and is there any uh, well seasonality analysis uh, this can be uh, done with autocorrelation function or with some uh, other uh, mathematical uh, tools which uh, uh, which are specific for the domain of signal analysis uh, and autocorrelation uh, it is uh, a tool which is able to show us the um, scale of uh, variability the scale of tendency of uh, some events being closer or further apart uh sorry i haven't got anything more in the presentation but let's go to the code uh and let's see how the basically how the illustrations in the in chapter three were made because that explains some OK, so uh, if you've got the uh, code, uh, this is um, this is three to one without the original word in the title three to one. Uh, in the chapter three folder. And uh, this refers uh, one moment, let me open the book. Uh, this refers 
uh, to uh, section 3.2 components of a spatial random process. Um, three to one spatial trends in data. Uh, the, the author of the book is considering a model which consists of a uh, uh, which contains one dependent variable, which is called capital I, uh, Y, capital Y, um, and that uh, is defined on uh, a random, uh, on a spatial um, component of uh, where we've got two um, uh, coordinates, X and Y. So Y dependent on X and Y. And it consists of a uh, of a uh, trend which is marked as capital T, just to make uh, things more complicated, uh, eta and epsilon. Uh, eta is the so T is the spatial will be the spatial component, uh, eta is the autocorrelated component, and epsilon is a random component. Uh, at first. We are uh, we are defining two homemade functions that uh, will be uh, cooking up data. Um, OK, I have read them in and I've got these libraries loaded, so it's not taking any time. Um, is it large enough now? Oh, yeah, it's large enough. Yeah, yeah. good. Can I um can I just make a comment about mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. on chapter uh, three point uh, uh, in section three point two? Is that um the when you glance at chapter three point two and you're defining with equations um, a very specific thing here they're calling it a spatial process. Um, and, you know, it's got these separate components that Jim um, described. It's got the the trend component. So it's, there's mm -hmm. a trend for the, uh, across the X and Y points. Then it's got the spatial autocorrelation component, again, associated with the same points, and then error associated with it. Um, the thing that I think it's important to talk about when you describe it like that is this is nothing but a linear model. It's just like simple linear regression or multiple mm -hmm. regression with a couple of terms. And a, a, that's a nice thing about statistics. Um, once you can start to accept that everything is a linear model, um, everything, at least to me, I, I had an epiphany early in my career that made me want to study statistics because I realized Oh, actually, once you can get over the shock of seeing lots of equations, it's all the same equation, in different forms. Uh, so yeah, this yeah. Is, this is <laughs> especially when you've got, uh, especially when you've got the tools of uh, linear algebra and matrix algebra. Okay, I admit that I did like that as well as a kid, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is just a like an equation for a line, <clears throat> and these uh, the parameters, the um, deterministic component, and the spatial autocorrelation component are just estimates, just like estimates from any linear model. All right. Uh, so this first, this block of code is just cooking up data and uh, I will um, uh, according to the equation, we've got the parameters that go into the uh, that go into the um, uh, equation. So I will run it all at once. Um, okay. We've got two ways to do it using Spatrick functions and using the homemade functions. Uh, I will only run uh, the, these homemade, homemade functions because I have read them in, so let them not go, go to waste. Uh, this is calculating the epsilon. We are getting the components. This is eta. This is the epsilon. We can see that 
it showed up here. And the correlated component plus uncorrelated component running it. And a deterministic logistic trend. Why is it so complicated? I haven't looked through it at that, but we've got several parameters and we are getting YDF uh, with two components, X and Y. Let, let me see what this object is. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, a thing that I might just say here is that mm -hmm. you've you've run quite a lot of code and you I don't think it actually pays to go through the code line by line other than to mm -hmm. say what you end up with here in this. This uh, data frame is um, just the components of how to calculate a point anywhere along the deterministic line and the and the, the random component due to autocorrelation of the line. So we're just going to plug these. For each x y so on you can see the last two columns there the, the first one is x that's going from i can't remember the range that was made mm -hmm. but um, for 19.5 y equals 19.5 and then it'll click down to 18.5 mm -hmm. and go through you know 0 0.5 to 19.5 so it's creating the um deterministic part of the model it's called a logistic model because it has that that funny shape. It's nonlinear. It's sigmoid. Um, so anyway, we've just made a data frame basically to we we faked the data frame to demonstrate this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once we've got the data frame with the data, uh, this block of code is making a uh is making the same illustration as in the book so uh this is the, the this is the spatial component of uh, of uh, the data the, the basis as we could, uh, perhaps i could use this word and these are the values we are getting and uh, it, it compo uh, it is composed of uh, this is the trend. This is the sum of the trend and autocorrelated uh, component. And this is everything when uh, the epsilon, the random um, component is added. We can see that there are smaller oscillations. This is smoothest, this is larger, and these are smallest oscillation. Hey, can you just make the figure a lot bigger? Because I think it's easier to see if we mm -hmm. look at the figure a lot bigger. We can still only see your R plot. If you zoomed it, you'll need to unshare and and share your desktop, not share a window. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. I will share the screen, and in that way, I'll be able to. There you go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. It's a little hard to see on this, but um, you just described it perfectly in words. But I, I think a way it, pay, it will pay just to think of this and linger on this. Make sure you take everybody with you. The darkest line is the straight line. That's a sigmoid curve. I, I can. Uh, we can cook up the actually the uh, color version. What yeah, it? let's cook okay. the color version. That's good. OK, let's give it a chance. <clears throat> Perfect. There we go. Okay. Uh, it's not, not exporting. Zoom. That's a lot better. Uh, perhaps it's not. Just a moment. Let me just find it. And uh, some. There you oh, go. Good. This will be a lot more clear to everybody except colorblind people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you can see the blue line. Yes. Uh, is very flat. And there, there is no, um, there are no sharp jags, and that's just the model of um, logistic expansion. You know, a, a, 
a, a an exponential um, rise up to the asymptote. And that's how some dependent variable would change. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the next one has the spatial autocorrelation. And so that one's the green one. And so you can see that that adds in a little bit of error around the prediction. And then the last one has the uh, the error component as well, and it's the more jagged one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I think we could relate it to a um, uh, real life scenario. For example, the blue uh, the, the blue trend could be uh, caused by the change in geographic latitude, for example. Uh, the, the green one uh, could be uh, related to the uh, to the height, that is to the uh, to the um, uh, geographical uh, to the height above uh, uh, the sea level, and it is naturally also correlated thing because uh, it's quite obvious that uh, high laying uh, laying ground. Uh, is very likely to be surrounded by high lying ground because it's sort of smooth and uh, undulates in, in a predictable way, while the red one can be a random component that uh, that uh, source of which we do not know and it simply rides on those and the sum of those two. Uh, and here we've got another example of the same plot with ggplot, so I will not be running it. And uh, we can also cook up the perspective plots. This is an interesting example, maybe not very visually appealing, but it's showing the thing in two dimensions. And let's see what it is. This is the trend, but this time it is shown as a uh, as a surface in space. So this is the trend without um, <clears throat> autocorrelation or without error. Yeah. <clears throat> Running the next one. This is trend fitted with a just linear function. Um, so obviously it's not curved any longer. Here is the trend. Fitted to the data based on so-called median polish. That's some sort of iterative process. I don't know how how it is. Well, uh, it's very nice to see it, but uh, I'm wondering what's the worth of it in terms of uh, how this uh, it cannot be dis uh, described mathematically, really. And what is what is the worth of it? Because that's uh, quite natural when we are uh, trying to fit uh, some model to the data. Usually we are uh, after some uh explanation some uh some general uh how to say uh, some general rule for example that that depends on that uh, quadratically or linearly uh, while this doesn't give any clear explanation to me but anyway i can i can explain it it's um mm -hmm. it is not well explained in the book but it's an old fashioned way that they used to solve this problem before we had fast computers, it's called. I think it's called median polish. Now, why it's called polish, I don't know, but it's called the median part comes from the fact that uh, in the olden days, this was an estimation of a um, point process where you would take um, a window on two dimensions around X and Y and uh, extrapolate the value of adjacent um, values based on the most common value, the median value. Why it's called median Polish? Now I don't know that, but this is tipping the hat to the uh, kind of the history of 
the modern statistics. <clears throat> it's just just glossing over the smaller. So this is polishing the data, perhaps. OK, um, I'm not sure if I if this example is working because one of these were not. Um, so here we've got a uh, fitting uh, in this uh, block of code. We'll be trying to fit. Uh, the uh, fits a model to a real life example. Uh, this was a. Um, uh, this is a data um, containing uh, sand uh, uh, sand concentration in some soil data. And again, uh, no, not that. Uh, the next one. Again. We've got geographical location and the concentrations uh, concentration of sand uh, represented as a perspective plot. And just by the look of it, we can see that there is some trend. Uh, the, when the data were cooked, we have we are in complete control of what uh, sort of trend uh, we are putting into that. But the normal life situation is there is something like that. And we are trying to disentangle the trends and everything. Hitting the linear model. To the data from the previous illustration. Uh, a quadratic model that is not linear. Uh, a smoother surface. And medium polish. Um, this one. Did it change? No, it's not. It's not plotting yet. Oh, here is the plot. So this is the medium polish uh, um, applied to the sand concentration data. So uh, I think this. Yeah, no data for this. This block of code uh, does not work with me. I didn't find which set it was. So basically that's it with the perspective plots. Uh, but I think. Uh, I think we should consider why is it? Why is it all being done? That's just fitting the models and. Uh, obviously fitting the model is fine and basically we know why why we are doing it. Uh, but the uh, specifics of spatial data uh, can affect um, can affect the statistics of the model, can affect the uh, strength of the models, and this is mainly due to autocorrelation. I don't think we will have time to delve into into uh, this today, uh, but I have read the rest of the chapter and will I will very gladly. Uh, present the rest of the chapter at the next um, at the next occasion, uh, and this is really uh, interesting and hard stuff which is uh, coming uh, there. So basically, uh, would you like me to try to go through uh, the explanation of stationarity with the uh, uh, with the uh, coin toss um, example? I think um, that starts uh, it starts another kind of topic. I mean, yeah. Maybe we could just talk for a few moments about the, the point of the chapter up to now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> like uh, those last three graphs were fairly humble, uh, the way they appeared in the chapter, but they um, that was an interesting journey that the the author takes you on <clears throat> and it essentially for us he he's looking back in history about 50 years and walking us forward to the way that we think about the statistics of, of spatial data now and um that last graph that last set of graphs maybe i'll just share my own computer on the so we can just easily look at all three of them together
this is a quite nice way to look at the um, the graphs all together uh, and the different aspects. And one of the points that he makes, one of the important points is that um, if you look at a spatial problem from the north direction, I'm looking at this upper left hand graph and we look at it on the north, right? And we just look at the the average or one slice of the the west dimension, just this first slice. And uh, we might think that we could um, describe that with a nonlinear term in a just regular old regression. But the interesting part about these spatial problems is that um, if we were to take this cube and and turn it uh, where we are facing the west side, we have another instance. It, it appears to be linear from that direction. It be, just becomes a very interesting and elegant mathematical problem. And the uh, the reason that we have to revert to the modern way of thinking about this that's kind of complicated um, it is to take into account that the nature of this relationship changes at every dimension in the other direction. And, and it's quite an elegant solution because we only end up with those three terms. <laughs> the uh, the uh, the uh, deterministic portion and the the correlation portion. Um, and, and of course, the error like we have in regular regression. So it's it's very closely related and it's it's just a little more complicated than simple linear regression. But yet we can capture. Um, a, a really, really subtle model. And if you imagine the thing, the trend here that is being measured, this is another interesting thing on this graph there. The language of the author is um, vague <laughs> and it's hard to it's hard to articulate it. Um, so it's not just you thinking about this, Jimic. It's um, but you can imagine that trend to be anything you can measure. It could be soil moisture. It could be the yield of um, <clears throat> of uh, some crop. It could be how many potatoes between 50 and 60 millimeters big you get for each plant at each point in the field. So it, it could actually be just anything. Um, this sets the stage for the more interesting stuff. And he he introduces in a brain dump all of these complicated topics here in chapter three, but then he has like a whole chapter to each of the topics later on <laughs> mm -hmm. to unpack it. Yeah, because this is this is what what this chapter really is about, and I haven't really got into this in this presentation, is the statistical consequences, that is the consequences of autocorrelation for the strength of the model, and this is really mind-blowing. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and but I must say that I've gone through the entire chapter and there is no satisfaction like uh, reading the book for the first time and just seeing black black letters on white and reading it after a week and another week and just seeing what it is about. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it might help in the future if, if we continue to do this. We'll, we'll try it for a couple more sessions and see what people think, but it, it is pretty hard stuff. You have to think deeply about it to get the most out of it. And I, I think you've just said that it, it takes you some thinking to get through it and really to get the idea. It's worth it because it's um, it's uh, something that probably everybody who's in here and even the people that were here earlier and other people that haven't come, this is important stuff for all of the kind of work that we're doing. So it is worth the investment um, and it just takes a little time to think about it. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be more illustrative next time. I, I think it would, I think a way to think about with this is um, if every once in a while, when you go through it, you, you did this tonight and it was good, it worked, is uh, let's just stop and maybe come up with an example like um, crop yield in a field and then uh, stop every so often and relate what we just talked about back to that simple example. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would, I think that would help bring as many people as we can along with us. Sure. Any comments uh, or, or questions from people? Is this the kind of thing that we like to do? Are you able to read the chapter before we come? Or, or maybe we should reiterate that message that you'll get a lot more out of this if we're reading the book together rather than um, passively um, 
having Shimmick explain in his own words what the chapter is. We'll get a lot more out of it if we read it together. For me, uh, I read, I studied the first version of this book quite, quite um, closely when I was uh, in grad school myself, and um, I didn't fully grasp how great the book is until later in my career when I started teaching with the first edition. And then recently the second edition has come out and it's much clearer. It's much easier to understand. It's a better book, but it is, it's not easy material. It's pretty hard material. He's not pulling any punches. So um, we'll have to read it to get the most out of it. W what do we think? Uh, do we, do we like this and want to continue? This um, stuff that um, people are interested in? Yes. <laughs> the thing I like about 